Christmas is around the corner. Are you hoping for something special this year? Maybe something that you wouldn't otherwise indulge yourself in? Or perhaps something meaningful from someone special? These are the things that I hope for for Christmas. So you can imagine my disappointment when one year I opened the package <laughs> and it was diapers. <laughs> they say feedback is a gift. <laughs> And we definitely receive a lot of it around here at the GSB. But have you ever felt less than appreciative of this gift? It doesn't have to be that way. You have the power to change feedback into something special. Stone and Heen, in their book, Thanks for the Feedback State, the bold-faced bold power of feedback, the bold-faced benefits of feedback are our relationships are richer, our self-esteem more secure, and of course we learn. We get better at things and we feel good about that. So today we'd like to spend a few minutes talking about feedback and how we have the power to change that as the receiver. There are two parts of every feedback conversation, the giver and the receiver. Today it's all about the receiver. Dave's going to talk to us a little bit about what might be going through our minds as we're receiving feedback. Louisa is going to spend a few minutes talking to us about how we have the power to shape that conversation. And finally, Berker will spend some time on some specific tactics that will enable you to better manage your next difficult feedback conversation. So with that, what might be going through your mind during a performance evaluation? Dave, I'd like to talk to you about my review this year. Why did I get a four out of five? Berker, we gave you a four based off your outstanding performance with the firm. We we're really happy with your job this year. Well, okay. I still feel four is low, but I suppose it's fine. A four is a great score, Berker. Great job this year. Is there anything that can be done? At this point, the decision's been made. Dave, what was going through Berker's mind during the conversation? When you have a feedback conversation, there are actually two conversations going on. The first is the conversation between yourself and the person who's giving you feedback. The second is a conversation with yourself. And managing the self-talk is critical to ensuring that you're able to have the actual conversation with the person who's giving you the feedback. And there are three triggers that I want to talk about today that can affect this conversation. The first of these triggers is the truth trigger. And the truth trigger our brains have a, have a natural instinct to self-protect ourselves and to disavow or invalidate any feedback that we're getting by trying to poke holes in the information that underlies that feedback. This can manifest as, that was taken out of context, or that's not really what happened. And it's important to try to be very specific when you're requesting feedback, and also, to, um, also important to clar ask clarifying questions so that both you and the receiver of the, you and the giver of the feedback can agree on the truth that underlies the feedback that you're getting. The second feedback, the second trigger is a relationship trigger. This deals with how you are receiving the feedback in the context of who's giving it to you. It's easy to think that person doesn't know me, or they just have it out to get me, and therefore be less receptive to the feedback that they're giving. And so it's really important to separate the person who's giving you the feedback from the feedback that you're giving to make sure that you can actually have a productive conversation with that person and realize that that person is probably well-intentioned. The third trigger that I want to talk about is the identity trigger. And this is all about how you internalize the feedback that you're being given. This usually goes one of two ways. On the one hand, we can say, this feedback it doesn't fit with who I think I am as a person, and therefore it's not valid. The other extreme is to take it way out of scope. So we can think, if someone tells me you weren't as confident as you could have been in that presentation, I can say I'm not a confident person, and I'll never be a confident person, so why should I even try? The important thing here is to clarify the scope of the feedback with the person who's giving it to you, and make sure that you're clear about the intent of the feedback. Once you're able to manage the self-talk, you can then think about how to shape the conversation with the other person. And Louisa is going to give us some practices to help shape that conversation. Thank you, Dave. So when we think about receiving feedback, we always think about ourselves as passive. But I want to invite you all to think of, to know that you have the power to shape the conversation as a feedback receiver. 
So think about feedback as a puzzle. You as a giver have pieces of it and you as a receiver has also pieces for that. I'm going to talk about some key frames to help you manage a better feedback conversation. But know that conversations are very fluid and sometimes when you try to set a very rigid structure, that doesn't really work. So think of them as talking points to help you better manage the feedback conversation. So what's the feedback conversation composed of? Three parts, open, body, and close. So first thing when you're starting a feedback conversation is when you open, be aligned. It's very important to, start to be clear what's the purpose of the feedback. So know what's the underlying motivation of the giver and why is he giving you that feedback. You have to know whether that decision is final or is that decision can be changed. And also very important, it's that you know who makes the final decision. There's a very interesting research from MIT that they analyze the outcomes of a negotiation and there's a very high correlation between good negotiation outcomes and how skillful the first five minutes of the conversation is. So do spend some time getting in line in the beginning. Then, the set, then we go to the body. That's where most of the conversation actually happens. And here the key is listening. But if you think that you're going to walk into a feedback conversation and have a one-on-one -on -one chat with your giver, think again. Because both your internal voices are going to be part of that conversation. And they're going to be quiet <laughs> until something emotional comes up. And then it brings all the trigger, triggers that Dave just talked to us about. The second thing is assert what's left out. You have your parts of the puzzle, so make sure you bring those parts to the table. But very important here, don't question the truth in the feedback that you're receiving. Just bring new information to the table. Thirdly, process moving. And what's that? Making an analogy with soccer, think about that you're not only a player, but you're also a referee. And by that I mean you're observing the game, you diagnose when things are not going wrong, and you're able to change gears and make sure that the conversation is moving towards a better direction. And finally, we are in business school, so we cannot forget problem solving. So think about ways you can make that feedback effective. So brainstorm ideas, dig for the underlying motivations, and think creatively. And finally, to close feedback, close with a commitment. What are you going to do differently from now on? It can be a process, so let's do another checkpoint from a month from now. It could be a benchmark. What are you going to be measured on? Or it could be something, okay, this is totally not working, let's try something different. And then you actually try to do something different. So now, with those lenses, let's look at the feedback evaluation once again. Dave, I'm surprised that I got a four instead of a five this year. Could you help me understand the evaluation a little bit better? Parker, I'm glad we're having this conversation. Do you think that you deserved a five? Well, I do. I worked really hard last year. I brought in new customers. Our sales are 20% up from the other year before. And I thought that was enough for a five. What are the other criteria? So you see here, the worker started by getting aligned and making really clear what's the purpose of this conversation. And he asked the right questions. But what if now, after he understood all the criteria, he still doesn't agree with his grade? What should he do? Hey, I hear you. I understand it. But I still feel, based on that criteria, that I should have a five. Were there any other relevant factors in my case? Berger, there are a couple of people on the committee that doubted your overall commitment to the firm. Mm -hmm. I disagree with them myself, and I didn't mention it to you because I thought it would be a disservice to even put it on your mind. I just don't think it's a big deal. Thanks for telling me, though. It's upsetting to hear. But it's useful information. I'd love to learn more about that perception. Would it be okay if I talk to someone from the committee to learn more about this? So you can see that this was a much more effective communication. He brings some pieces that were left out and he got some more useful information that he can use moving forward. He also closed with a commitment. So now, Berger is going to talk to us about some very practical tips on how we can all become better feedback receivers. Thanks, Lisa. I think we all agree that the second conversation was much better. But in real life, it's a long and difficult process to go from the first one to the second. Today, I want to share with you a few practical tips to make that journey easier. First one, keep it simple. Typically, the feedback we receive in the real world is too much and too vague. We saw in this conversation, you have the power to make it actionable. 
So end of the conversation, always ask, what is the one thing I can change? Second tip, try small experiments. Acting on feedback is like a New Year's resolution. If you say that I will be a healthy person this year, you'll fail. Instead, start with the Monday lunch. I'll have this. Try something for Friday. Try these small things and see how it feels. Third one, write out the J-curve. The journey from good to great is not a linear one. Once you try out something new, it will feel uncomfortable. And you will actually feel, uh, perform worse for a while. So when you're acting on feedback, mind that gap. Make sure that you know there's light at the end of the tunnel. Fourth one, coach your coach. Again, in real life, conversations are not one-off. You have continuous relationship with the people who are giving you feedback. You can go out to them, talk to them, and let them know what is your style and your preferences. That will make the conversation much better. Last one, as Julie was mentioning, feedback is not just about improving yourself. It's also to build relationships, strengthen relationships. So don't wait for your next feedback conversation. Reach out to people, invite them into this conversation, start that conversation yourself. With that, I would like to remind you, as the receiver, you have the power to shape this conversation, change this conversation. It's a science and an art to receive the feedback. First, start with your self talk. Secondly, change the conversation itself. And third, keep in mind those practical tips to start right away.